significantly more activity for highly sensitive people in a certain part of the brain that contains mirror neurons in common language translates into empathy and the ability to experience someone else's experience as your own. Tend to be very high performers because of their conscientiousness and their work ethic, but interestingly they also scored lowest on job satisfaction, a game or a spectrum of extremes with highly sensitive people. You put a lot in the work you do, but also you tend to be more stressed. If we have chasers or aggressors in our dreams, and if we have any conscious control over it, is to face the person or to face the aggressor and to try and communicate with them. Hi everybody and welcome to Illuminating Dialogues number 23, where I have the opportunity to sit down with Beatrice Sornick today. Thank you for taking the time and sitting down uh, all the way from Romania today. <laughs> Pleasure and thank you so much for inviting me. I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, just to introduce yourself for viewers who may not be familiar with your work, um, Beatrice Zornick has a degree in psychology and is a certified transformational coach in Animas, the same school I was trained in, and a certified coach supervisor as an accredited coach with the International Coaching Federation or ICF. Beatrice has worked for large organizations such as Google and before becoming a coach, she was the head of people at a market research organization in London. Beatrice has supported hundreds of highly sensitive people or HSPs that we'll get into today through living a life of purpose and meaning in a way that's aligned to them. So that's super fantastic work um, you're doing. I know I'm really aligned to the work that you're doing and um, yeah, I can't really wait to delve into sort of personality, um, kind of Jung's work for people who are familiar with that transformation for like ourselves but also our clients and if we got time uh, hopefully dreams and like the symbolism behind mm -hmm. that and I know we both played <laughs> World of Warcraft so how can that sort of like kind of have similar chords running through but before we kind of dive into um, all of these topics um, this podcast is called Illuminating Dialogues it's a space where I invite people to share their journeys and perhaps venture into a place that we haven't gone to before and perhaps illuminate um, knowledge, wisdom for ourselves, but also for the listeners listening uh, today. So with that being so, uh, said, my first question to you is, what lights you up? Mm. Thank you for that beautiful introduction. I'm, I'm hoping to be able to live up to the aspiration of illuminating. Um, what lights me up? I, I think for me, this question is twofold. There is a, um, an internal process and an external process. So what lights me up internally is when I am able to remove pieces of who I'm not and become more of who I am. And it's really interesting how many things we develop in response to ex expectations from society and from people around us. Um, and I think then we, we spend a long time to undo that and to become more of who we are. Um, and this journey lights me up a lot. And then externally, what lights me up is to be able to support other people on the same journey of becoming who they are. Because I think ultimately the purpose of transformation, if and maybe I'm a bit idealistic, but maybe even the purpose of life is to become more of who we are. Mm. And it's a real privilege to be able to witness that and to be part of that together with others. Yeah, and I think it's so, it's such a mysterious concept as well, like who are we? <laughs> like mm. who are we becoming? Because we kind of don't know. 
And I think that's kind of the interesting part of being a coach because we don't really know where we're going with the client. Mm. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm wondering um, if you could share with the viewers before we delve into, you know, coaching highly sensitive people, if you could share with them a bit about your, um, your journey um, how you've started to, yeah, delve into personality, um, you know, become a coach and what were kind of the factors leading up for you to go on this journey? Mm -hmm. Yeah. When I was in high school, <laughs> I studied maths and physics and um, everyone in my class wanted to become a programmer. And I was the only person who decided to study psychology. Um, and it was just like a flash of insight that I had that I said, I'm going to study psychology. It was almost like an act of rebellion against, you know, everyone else wanting to become a programmer. But then once I said that, once it came out in the open, it um, became more and more started resonating with me. So that's what led me to study psychology. And I wanted to become a therapist afterwards, but um, obviously it's a long and expensive process and not um, easy for a fresh graduate to afford. Um, and over time, this there was a thread, you know, in all my jobs, everything I did, I worked in sales, I worked in HR, um, but there was this thread around supporting other people. And um, I remember a time, a session I had with my coach was probably like eight years ago or something where I was telling her that I wasn't feeling quite happy in my, in the work I was doing. It felt a bit repetitive and a bit dull. And she said, well, if you could do anything you wanted, what would you do? And I just kind of blurted out and I said, I would do what you do. Wow. And then I just covered my mouth and I went, did I just say that? Um, and of course, I didn't. Um, but I that session really stuck with me, made a real impact on me. And then I was working um, in a in a senior role that was quite um, stressful, and I ended up having some health issues and experiencing uh, burnout. And I realized I needed to make some real drastic changes to my life and also to my lifestyle. Um, and that the current, you know, corporate path was no longer feasible for me. Mm long term if I wanted to look after myself and um, that just became the perfect opportunity for me to train as a coach uh, fulfill my my promise that I'd made um, years back to my um, to my coach but I never really had the courage to do that um, and once I did that I never never looked back since and that's nearly six years ago now wow and yeah, like, I think as people even listen to you speak, they might resonate with being in a place where that's not aligning to them. I know I was in a corporate women's group, like first guy presenter, <laughs> no pressure, but, um, you know, we had that conversation of like, okay, how can we actually be more comfortable being ourselves in work? But ultimately, I think mm -hmm. if it's not aligned with us, then no matter how much we try, um, yeah, like we kind of have the courage to step into that, mm -hmm. which I feel like you quite beautifully did. Um, what do you feel it is about that that culture that, I don't know, causes people or perhaps a personality in specific to feel that burn or to feel not um, aligned? Because it, it's not a rational thing, right? It's not like you can say, um, okay, like you can clearly say this is not aligned to me people might be stuck in their head and trying to like fit into that role. So what, what is it that actually helped you realize that's not for you kind of thing, mm. and help your clients as well? I'm just going to write that down. 
Um, I think the predisposition to burnout, and I'm I'm not an expert on, on burnout apart from experiencing it myself and working with clients who have been through burnout or are experiencing stress and are at risk of burnout. But um, in many cases, the actual experience of burnout and coming out of burnout is very often a topic for therapy. Mm. Um, so I'm not speaking as an expert on burnout, but um, I feel that what causes us to be more prone to burnout perhaps is a combination of factors. So one uh, might be internal, how you process information, how you um, uh, respond or react to stress, how much stress you're able to take, your work ethic, because very often people who experience burnout have extremely high work ethic, um, very often are perfectionists, they work very hard, they don't want to disappoint, they mm. care a lot, they are very conscientious. And all these things can contribute to the experience of burnout because they tend to take a lot of responsibility on their um, shoulders. And then um, combined with that, there is um, organizational cultures, um, societal expectations um, that can all, you know, con contribute to that and can eventually lead to burnout. Um, and I think what made me realize that the job was not for me, I don't know, you know, I think in my experience, I think a lot of the stress I experienced was stress I created for myself, partly because I wanted to do a good job mm. and I wanted to be successful and I wanted people to be, to feel proud of me or to feel like I was making a contribution. Um, but also because I was struggling to um, do things like set boundaries or say no, or be able to communicate these things in an effective way without feeling like um, either like I was disappointing people or that I would get in trouble, mm. you know, if I would say no. So um, that combined with, you know, sometimes when you don't listen to your stress or your body, then there are additional things that tend to escalate more and more. And that's how I ended up, you know, having the health issues and then um, feeling fatigued all the time. And then there came a point where I just had to see the signs and I had to respond to that. Mm. I think I can relate so much to um, mm. with that personality trait of like, yeah, setting boundaries or like uh, yeah, feeling like you're going to get into trouble. Because almost like when you're in external culture, it can feel like it's demanding a lot from you. And so sometimes when we have a certain personality that struggles with that, it's almost as if to even be setting boundaries that constantly might actually work in detriment to our personality, if that makes sense. So you were talking about um, boundaries and like setting boundaries and not getting into trouble and stuff. And that being like mm. a personality um, kind of nav navigation. But at the same time, if the culture is not set up to allow that, if the culture is always demanding lots and lots of work for you, you know, is it that person's responsibility to manage himself? Or is it, you know, actually a solution to step out of that culture? Because it seems to me that culture might not be suited to that type of personality. Yeah. I think that's a very complex question yeah. of a chicken and egg, yeah. which came first. And I think, like all relationships, I think work relationships are co-created as well. Mm. So it's a combination of things. So, for example... Culture change in organizations is very important. And I think very often we try to treat the person, mm. but then they're still part of a system that's not conducive to their health and well-being. So then no matter how much you work with the individual to support them, if the system isn't supportive of their well-being, then you're constantly going to have this conflict. 
Um, but then equally, you might remove yourself from an organization that's unconducive to your well-being. But even if you move in a different environment, if you struggle with boundaries, with, um, you know, uh, having an appropriate life work balance, um, saying no and things like that, then you will still encounter those things, even in an environment that is more um, supportive. So it's two separate things and both equally important. Yeah, I think that's a really good distinction. That's something that we were taught as well in Animas, right? The systems thinking approach. Mm. It's not just the individual, but it's a, it's a system that plays into that as well. And yeah, because a lot of people will go into this anger, frustration piece and say, okay, I want to leave this environment. But like you quite nicely said, they still have to kind of deal with still their, their personality and, and how they're working. So yeah, there there is sort of like a middle middle way there. Um, I'm just wondering as well for the viewers who are not familiar with HSPs, like how did you begin to come across that term, recognizing yourself, recognizing others? If you could explain to people what is this magical term HSP? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I first came across it. I was very interested in Myers Briggs, yeah, um, or MBTI. Um, and I kept coming across the term and I started wondering what it was. Um, and basically, if you want to find out the easiest way to find out if you are a highly sensitive person is just to Google um, the term. And there is a test that you can do online for free. It's a self-assessment. Um, and it's considered, well, it is a personality trait. Um, and... It has uh, been shown on MRI, so people who have this trait uh, have had their brain scanned to see their responses and how they might, whether there are any differences between the brain of an HSP and the brain of a non-HSP. Mm. Um, and what they've noticed was that there is um, significantly more activity for highly sensitive people um, in a certain part of the, the brain that's responsible for, that contains mirror neurons, um, which in common language translates into uh, empathy and the ability to experience someone else's experience as your own. Mm. So kind of to be able to put yourself in another person's shoes. And this is one of the key um, aspects that defines what a highly sensitive person is, which is that we tend to have a lot of empathy. Um, in addition to empathy, um, some of the other things that um, describe it. So Elaine Aaron, uh, Dr. Elaine Aaron, who coined the term and she has been researching it for over 30 years. Um, she describes the term in a, an acronym, which is D-O-E-S, like does. Oh. Um, so D stands for depth of processing. Um, so when we receive any kind of stimuli, whether it's information or sounds or emotions, uh, we process those more deeply, which is also the reason why highly sensitive people tend to need more space to recharge and space to um, to process information. Um, the other one is overstimulation. Um, so because of the, our depth of processing, there is a risk that we might become overstimulated when, for example, if you go to a shopping center, there is a lot of stimulation there because there is all the stuff you can buy and then there's the noise and then there's lots of people and scents and smells and um, that can be overstimulating for a highly sensitive person. Um, e stands for uh, empathy. Um, and I've, I've mentioned that. And the S stands for sensing the subtle. So HSPs tend to have an ability to feel things that may not be verbalized. So for example, if a person is upset, even if they're not displaying that, they might notice that. Or uh, very often they might walk into a meeting room and 
there's a group of people there and everyone's quiet, but they can sense that, oh, th- these people must have had an argument or something because something feels off. So it's kind of uh, like that, that's uh, sensing the subtle. Um, and then some common challenges that uh, HSPs might have in daily life um, are around boundaries, which I've mentioned. Um they tend to also be, there was a study done, now I can't recall all the details, but there was a study around um, employee satisfaction and also employee performance. And those employees that were highly sensitive people scored very highly on conscientiousness and also on job performance. So they tend to be very high performers because of their conscientiousness and their work ethic. But interestingly, they also scored lowest on job satisfaction out of the whole organization. So it's um, it's often a game or a a game or a spectrum of extremes with highly sensitive people. You put a lot in the work you do, but also you tend to be more stressed than you tend to be. So it's kind of like the the positive side of the personality and then the potential negative consequences they can have on us. We have a lot of empathy, which is a very positive trait because it's uh, it translates into compassion and care and support for others and um, doing the right thing and uh, morals and ethics. But at the same time, when you are a very empathic person, you risk taking on other people's emotions feeling other people's stress, taking on the burdens of the the world, because there are so many things in the world that are happening that are, you know, painful um, to experience. So then the question becomes, how do we take these extremes and modulate them or work with them in a way that we can benefit from the positive aspects without becoming drained or um, negatively impacted by the the shadow side of that. Wow. Thank you for explaining all of that. Um, yeah, I really like resonate with a lot of these um, aspects. And I'm just wondering, like, how did you start to um, yeah, cultivate your positive side? in your life but also start to yeah make sure that negative side wasn't kind of eating away your energy um so much hey everybody sorry to interrupt your podcast but if i could take the time to ask you if you could please subscribe to this channel this would help me as i grow the channel to share the deep knowledge and wisdom of our guests and i'd love to share them offering one-to-one coaching if you want to dive deeper and know what lights you up in a safe and professional manner to do things wholeheartedly for a career you like and to do things such as meditation, dive into your personality with certain Eastern and Western tools and I'd love to share with you some of the testimonials I've had from previous clients. So if that floats your boat and you'd like to go slow to go far, then you can have a free strategy session with me. You can visit my website, jyoti.com. That link should be in the description. Enjoy the rest of the podcast. I'll share some tools I've used, um, but also what shifts Mm. happen for me to be able to, to lean more into the positive aspects. So in terms of tools... A range of things. First of all, reading about psychology, which is a big passion of mine. Um, going to therapy um, regularly. I work with a Jungian analyst. Uh, as you know, I'm very interested in Jungian psychology. Um, that's been very helpful. Coaching, uh, meditation. There are lots of ways, lots of different tools that people can find that are supportive of them because we each function in a different way. 
uh, and we might have different needs. For other people, it's being in nature and that can be enough or painting or a creative outlet. Um, so I don't want to be, I think it's important to not be restrictive and say, right, uh, coaching is the solution or therapy is the solution. Although I do think therapy can be very beneficial for, uh, for many of us, especially highly sensitive people, because through our sensitivity, through our ability to notice everything, through our empathy, um, through the way we process information more deeply, this also makes us more prone to, um, for example, if we grow up in environments that aren't um, always loving and always supportive and always attuned to our needs, um, we can be more likely to develop, to experience trauma um, or things that might stick with us over time and might need uh, support and therapy. So that's certainly been the case for me. I don't want to over -gener to generalize, um, but I think it's a, a useful inquiry for, for most of us HSPs, um, at least an inquiry. Um, and what's helped me lean into the positives? Um, what shifts have I made? I don't know if helped. I think sometimes moments, the biggest moments of adversity are, can also be the biggest lessons, mm. which is, you know, I certainly wouldn't recommend that people seek adversity on purpose. But if you are in a moment of, of adversity, for me, it was burnout. I didn't choose to burn out, obviously. Um, but through being burnt out, I was sleeping 12 to 14 hours for about two years. I was tired all the time, exhausted, didn't have... Um, I had energy, but I had a lot less energy than I, than I would normally have. Um, and then sleeping so long also meant I had less time in a day um, to do anything. So um, this situation really challenged me to see that I'm not able to do everything I was able to do before. And it kind of forced me in the beginning to, I had to set some boundaries. I had to say no to some things because I just didn't have the time or the energy to do um, all of the same things. And that was very difficult in the beginning when you're, when you're in that space in between, mm. you're no longer able to be the, the, the person you were, but you're not yet the person you're becoming. Mm. Um and it's very difficult to reconcile that. Um, so that was the first step in starting to set boundaries, the, the actual adversity, the need. I was forced to, um, to, to set them and to start to live differently. Um, and then through support, through therapy, um, I've started to work on things like whether I deserve that. Um, because for many of us, and that's certainly been true for me, we learn that our worth is attached to our productivity, to our success, to our degrees, certifications, reputation, whether we have a house, whether we have a family and children and so on. Um, and to internalize that you have worth irrespective of what you do and what you achieve um that was a long journey but totally worth it yeah i think that speaks a lot of levels like the depth of i think i went through that as well as like the work i do is not equivalent to like me so if i'm like maybe challenged at something that's not my skill and i'm trying my best but not doing a great job that's not a reflection of my worth and that was mm -hmm. like hmm because um like you said emotional processing so from an indian community especially first second generation i'm third generation that depth of emotional processing is not there and you could argue you know as a collective as, as humanity we didn't have spaces for that um mm -hmm. you know in the recent centuries of course i feel like in the ancient indigenous wisdom, they did have that. But um, just having that emotional space to emotional process, and I feel like that's so important. 
um, especially for like the highly sensitive people. And you mentioned, uh, sorry, you're going to say something. I was just going to say, if you just think about it, um, about a hundred years ago, yeah, or maybe a bit over a hundred years ago, we didn't even have cars. Mm. <laughs> we didn't have TVs, or maybe you know, maybe cinemas. Like a hundred or hundred and fifty years ago, um, there was hardly any stimulation. People were much more in touch with their nature. We were in touch with nature because many people worked uh, fields or agriculture or uh, manual labor. Um, we were much more connected with each other physically. Um, and there wasn't that much stimulation around. There wasn't, there just wasn't much. Um, and this is our grandparents or grand grandparents. Um, mm. And now the, the world has changed completely because there is so much stimulation. There is constant stimulation. There are TVs and screens and phones and uh, internet and Facebook. And um, so our brains as humans haven't been wired to uh, cope with the amount of stimulation we have. Um, and, you know, our brains evolved over thousands or even millions of years. Um, but the changes that have happened over the last 100 or 150 years, our brains haven't been able to catch up with um, the amount of stimulation. And then add to that, if you're also a highly sensitive person, that just makes it even more um, uh, potentially challenging. So, yeah, you're right that having that space to process mm -hmm. Um, can be very important. Yeah, I think that was a super interesting context you brought there because it seems to me that, you know, we've kind of like automized like the way we do catering or the way mm -hmm. we have HR roles. And if if you had my skill set, your skill set, and we were 200 years ago, we wouldn't have to be seeing batch, pe you know, people at this high, high pace, pace of living, right? So that sensitive skill set would kind of be normal. Um, but it's almost having to be stretched into quite a small amount of time and uh, a lot of uh, the pace of jobs nowadays, which is quite interesting to look at it in that way in terms of uh, human evolution. And I know being both kind of like MBTI, you know, people who are interested or nerds for that, that lack of a better word, um, we're both ENFJ, right? Type is ENFJ. And um, I'm just wondering how you've balanced being an extrovert. So people who don't know, E is extrovert, N is more intuitive, uh, F is feeling, and J is um, more the, the judgment, but not in the way that you think. Um, so how did you balance being that highly sensitive but also being an extrovert at the same time? Because that seems kind of like, you know, opposites. Yeah. So from a Myers-Briggs perspective, uh, if, if your viewers are interested in, uh, in MBTI, um, most highly sensitive people tend to be NF personality types, so intuitive feelers. Um, there is a, about 70% of highly sensitive people are introverts and about 30% are extroverts. Um, and yeah, that has been a really interesting journey. And it's only in the last few years that I've started to understand what it means for me to be an EN, to be an extrovert and also a highly sensitive person. Um, and to realize that I need space to recover, space to process and space to integrate. And um, very often we think about this need to integrate or need for space as something negative. Why can't I just process things and get on with the job? But actually, um, there is a huge benefit to this because through the space we give ourselves to process information, um, this is how we develop a lot of wisdom. Um, so we're able to access much deeper insights. We're able to, um, if you integrate information, if you process information, you're able to offer a lot more, um, than if you don't give your space to, to process because we're, we tend to function and work and communicate 
at a much more at a much deeper level. So if we keep things superficial, then we never really get to shine our light. So I think that um, having the space is really important. Yeah. And I started from talking, oh, how do I balance being an, an extrovert? Yeah, yeah. Um, I can now embrace having space for myself. I think for a long time, because I was an extrovert, I was quite afraid to be alone. So I was seeking other people's company all the time. And I think that's natural, especially in uh, young uh, uh, adulthood it's normal for us to lean more into our primary function. Mm. Um, and Jung, who actually created the personality typing, and then it was taken over by uh, uh, Myers-Briggs, um, who created this self-assessment. Um, but Jung was saying that the purpose is for us to start to learn and lean more into all of our functions. And we start to do this naturally around uh, midlife, which you defined as 35 to 40 years old. Um, and then the goal is for us to be able to lean more and more into all our functions, including the uh, inferior function, which obviously is very, uh, very difficult to, to get to that. So for, because my main function is a, a feeling, my uh, inferior function is uh, introverted thinking. Um, I might be getting a bit too technical here. No, no, like it would be nice because we had all, also a, a INFJ podcast where we've already gone mm -hmm. through all the technicalities. So it'd be right. nice to know if TI or so introverted thinking is a shadow and really what is a shadow and how can people start to tap into that? Mm. Yeah, good question. So in every aspect of life, not just in MBTI, the things that we are strongest at and best at. So if you're an extrovert, a very, very big extrovert, then there will be a shadow side of that, which we might be neglecting. So for me, I saw people's company all the time and I thought it was because I was an extrovert and it was because I was an extrovert. But then I found that when I was alone, I would start to get thoughts. I would start to get self-critical. I would start to ruminate. Um, so that kind of compounded itself and made me seek people's company even more mm. because I didn't want to experience that stuff. Mm. Um, and I think... It's useful for us to inquire when I am expressing my strengths, what am I avoiding or what am I not expressing or what is not happening while I am doing that. Mm. That makes sense. Yeah. So it's, it's, so for you and me, it'd be that TI, that introverted thinking almost. Mm -hmm. And so how would you personally like lean into that TI? What would help you? practically like um practice that almost yeah that's very difficult to say um i do feel that in recent years i've become more introverted but it's probably just a reflection on the fact that i'm no longer leaning into my main function mm. anymore um so there's definitely ways in which you can practice things but it's very difficult with something that's a shadow it's um you know, one way to practice it is, for example, if you're a right-handed person to write with your left hand. Um, personally, I my therapist is an INTP, so mm. her leading function is uh, introverted thinking. Um, and it really helps me to work with someone who can both be supportive and create a, a, a positive space for me. Uh, but also to express those things that I'm not able or to see those things that I'm not as easily able to see. Mm. So these are a couple of ways in which I practice it. Yeah, I had like quite a few INTP friends and tapping into their TI. It's like, yeah. how did you notice all these details and things? Mm -hmm. And, you know, like, because I have like a baby uh, introverted thinking so that mm -hmm. really helps, especially at school okay. and a lot of projects. So I've noticed that in myself. Um, 
But I've also spoke to a lot of coaches who who will say, oh yeah, personality and all of these like human design and Enneagram, you know, they're not very helpful. Like, um, but I would argue that kind of knowing my personality and also I've done this with clients and knowing all of these models, for example, on Enneagram, I'm a two wing three, that's actually empowered me to know certain tendencies that I naturally, like you said, just naturally drawn to or naturally weak at. And then I can start building from there. So I guess it helps with that initial awareness, but not to get too um, identified with it, if that makes sense, but to use it as a framework to evolve. Yeah, exactly. I think every framework can be useful. Mm. For some people, it feels like it's a label or... I'd be putting myself in a box and I don't want that. I just want to be me. So that's valid as well. Um, personally, I really, I was fascinated by any kind of uh, framework or personality typing um, just to help me understand myself more and potentially from a different perspective. And I've found all these tools uh, really helpful. I um read about MBTI obsessively for uh, years. So I probably went into that space of over-identifying. Um, and what I mean by that is that when you lean too much into a framework, the risk is that you see everything through that lens mm. and not everything in life can be explained through a single lens. Mm. So I think it's useful to be able to pick something up, to read about it, to immerse yourself in it, to see what you can take from it. Um, but also not to get so pulled into that, that you um, are no longer able to see life from any other perspective than from that framework. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I know I've definitely felt in to that trap as well <laughs> um <laughs> a lot of times and i'm just wondering um if you could give us like a peek into Jungian analysis like to get a bit technical how does that sort of work uh, what did Jung kind of set up there and how are you using a Jungian analysis uh, in that space yeah so um a few years ago, I started coming across a lot of things I was reading that were mentioning Jung. So um, I started, I tried to read his books, which are very difficult to read, by the way. Um, mm -hmm. But there are many Jungians who were able to translate his work into a way that's more accessible for, you know, us normal people <laughs> who um, aren't uh, that academic or uh, into the, like, the details of analysis um so he um i lean more into the jungian psychology and the jungian principles obviously jungian analysis is a specialized uh, uh, psychotherapy field which i'm you know i'm not uh, immersed in apart from being in therapy um with a jungian analyst and some aspects from jungian psychology that have been very helpful for me first of all shadow um, that's been very helpful shadow basically representing all the things that we don't want to be they're very often reflected in things we hate in other people or have a very very strong negative emotions towards um, these tend to be these tend to, sh to lead the way towards our um, shadow um personality typing has been very useful dreams and symbolism and understanding archetypes i could probably go on but these are some key ones yeah nice i would yeah i would love to kind of like delve into how people can start to um go into their shadow a bit more because we did do a podcast on shadow work mm -hmm. but how can dreams and archetypes behind that because it seems to me that a highly sensitive people could be a sort of archetype as well and sort of um and sort of there could be different archetypes at play that we could tap into that might be in our shadow that could empower us mm -hmm. to to grow yeah i think there is a lot of um there's a lot of hype around the word shadow and shadow work mm. these days. Um, and 
Of course, there are some tools we can use. So, for example, there is the work of Byron Katie. Her work relates a bit to shadow work as, you know, perhaps Jung envisioned it. Um, and I don't think Jung ever called it shadow work uh, because, and I think in the society we live today, which is all about, you know, instant gratification and finding, getting to the answer and the solution, we're very focused on, right, how do I transform my shadow? Mm. Um, but if you think about it as a long-term process, potentially for your entire life, where you will be constantly working with shadow, um, then you can see things in a bit more perspective. Mm. Um, perhaps as a starting point, I might recommend a book. Um, there is a book called Meeting the Shadow. Uh, it's written by Connie Zweig. Um, and it's actually a, an anthology of um, Jungian writers who wrote about shadow. Uh, and it's about how shadow can show up in different aspects of our lives. Because the more we understand how shadow shows up, the more we can start to recognize it. Uh, when it happens for us. Because before we recognize that something might be shadow, we are responding or reacting to our environment and feeling righteous in doing so. So for example, let's say your partner doesn't um, tell you when he's invited family over. Mm. And that makes you very angry and you start, you know, re reacting to that. And there is truth in that. Of course, there is a valid reason why you're feeling angry. But then the question is whether the affect and the emotion you're experiencing might be disproportionate to the situation. Mm -hmm. And very often... Um, seeing whether the affect was disproportionate is only available to us in hindsight. You know, a couple of days later, you might go, yeah, that was a bit annoying, but actually I, I reacted quite strongly to that. So what might have been going on that might be leading um, in some way to um, our shadow. So the more we get to know what aspects could be shadow, the more we start, we can start to do some of that inquiry uh, internally. Mm. And I find that like, uh unconscious or subconscious part very interesting because i know there's a diagram and i might put it up here during editing where mm -hmm. there's like almost a anima and animus part which is funny because that's the school that we trained in and there's like a super ego and an ego part as well and um, that jung also um, mapped out and coming from the eastern background you know we talk about things like karma which is also these unconscious loop patterns that happen and when we become aware through meditation or mantra meditation then that's how we can start to view these karmas so i mm -hmm. find it quite interesting coming from the east and western side mm -hmm. so i'm just wondering um have you delved into these aspects of like ego super ego at all uh, in your uh, research yeah, so ego and superego were terms that were originally created by Freud, mm. uh, and Jung was Freud's closest apprentice, and then um, they split up and Jung created his own psychology. So he kept the term of uh, ego, he didn't keep the, the superego, um, but it's still a very common term that's used in psychology. Um, instead, he used the term persona, which is the part of the ego, um, the, the side of us that we want to show to the world. So, for example, I might know about myself that I am... Uh, I get tired and overstimulated by people, Um but what I show to the world is that I have energy and I'm lively and I don't show them that side of me. So this part of me is conscious, which is why it's part of the ego. So the ego represents the conscious, but I don't show that. So the persona would be only the things I show to the external world. Mm, so it's kind of like when you're like at a party or whatever and you're wanting to like go, but you're like still smiling and like a part of mm. you is like, wanting to go but like you're not actually going so that's so it's like there's two things going on there in the mind but that's conscious mm, yeah well for example being a mother you know 
um, I, I'm not a mother, but um, I uh, I have a lot of friends who are, and they will talk about how they, you know, how they talk about themselves, and very often it's difficult for them to admit uh, feelings like feeling challenged or feeling tired or things like that, and they might try to show to the other mothers that they have it all together or that they're not tired or um, things like that. So these are the differences between you know, persona and ego. Mm. Um, and then obviously, as you delve deeper, you get to the to the shadow and the unconscious. And very often these things um, can only become apparent through um, multiple, once we have multiple pieces of information, we can start to put the pieces together and go, hmm, it seems uh, every time I feel that someone is making a decision without me, like my partner inviting the family over. Every time that someone is making a decision without me, that seems to create a very strong affect in me. So what is going on there? And sometimes your dreams might be pointing uh, to that in some way as well. Uh, but dreams are so highly symbolic that it's very difficult to start to decipher them and when you do try to decipher them, it's usually from your ego that you try to decipher them. Um, and it, it, it's more difficult without having support to decipher them. Mm. And what have you found helpful in, yeah, archetypes, symbols, um, in the waking state, but also in the dream state, um, to actually help you on that journey? What's, what's, what's been your journey in, into that, like dream interpretation and symbolism? Um, a book I recommend often, so if you're interested in dream analysis, especially from a Jungian perspective, is um, it's called uh, Dreams, a Portal to Source, and it's written by uh, Edward Whitman and Sylvia Pereira. Um, I found that book very helpful in addition to the dream work that I do um, in my therapy. Um, was your question what's been helpful? Yeah, is there any like practical examples that you've like seen like some symbolism that you could relate to a certain um, emotion or a certain event? Um, hmm. For example, I used to have a recurring dream of being chased by someone and in every dream I'm I'm running and I'm running and I'm running and I usually wake up just before the person, you know, uh, catches me. Mm. And I've done a lot of work on that in therapy to identify what that's about. Very often it's a part of you that um, there might be some, you know, some aggression. For example, self-criticism is a form of aggression. Mm. So that can then show up in a dream by someone chasing you or wanting to harm you because it's showing you that there might be a part of you that's working, you know, working against you. Um, and actually Jung very often said that if we have chasers or aggressors in our dreams um, and if we have any conscious control over it is to face the person or to face the aggressor and to, try and communicate with them because um, very often we we misinterpret we misinterpret what it means and we uh, the dynamic continues uh, but this has been one of the biggest shifts through therapy and the work I've done on on my own self-criticism on my own self-worth on embracing who I am and not feeling bad about that um, that it was just in the last year, actually, that I uh, noticed not only that the dreams of being chased have stopped, but actually now I'm starting to get dreams where there are people coming to support me when there is something negative happening. Like uh, in one dream, there was a policeman who came to help me and arrested the, you know, the the person who was who was trying to harm me. So. It's like your dreams are showing you that there are positive parts of you that are developing and starting to, to support you and that those negative things are starting to become smaller and more able to, um, to deal with. Amazing. And we talked about internal family systems. I don't know if you're familiar mm. with this in the previous podcast. So, okay. 
Yeah, and and um, I also was reading the red or listening to part of the red book um, by Carl Jung, the Swiss psychologist, um, last year, and he used this term active imagination, where mm-hmm. he'd follow his imagination um, and keep following that. So the the visualization or the intuition would just unfold in these different characters. And as it was explained, it seemed to me, like you said, that these parts are actually part of us, but the subconscious just forms that in an abstract way. So like you said, the chaser is actually part of us and the runner is also part of us. And it's Mm. our relationship to them, which I find very fascinating because often we would say, oh, that person was in my dream, but Mm -hmm. that person is has been animated by our consciousness. So it's actually a mm-hmm. part of us, right? Yeah. Very nice way of explaining that, yes. And um, not always. Sometimes when we dream of other people, it might be about that other person or our relationship to the other person. Like the dream is trying to show us something about the relationship. Um, but in 99 or the vast majority of cases, other people that we know might represent a part of us that we're not consciously uh, aware of. So then doing that inquiry can be useful. And active imagination, you can can read about the process, can be a really useful uh, type of work to try and continue a dream. And um, uh, which is why if you meditate, for example, active imagination can be a, a very useful process to just allow the the dream or the story to continue, but without trying to influence it. And that can be a bit difficult because even when you're meditating, you're still consciously aware. And when you're consciously aware, there is a small risk that the ego might want to influence how the, um, the active imagination goes. Um, and sometimes you might do that on purpose, like, for example, if someone is chasing you in a dream and through active imagination and uh, meditating, you might try to meet that aggressor and see, try to have a conversation with them and see what they want. Yeah, I find that unfolding quite interesting because I know in companies in corporate, they would do active visualizations, right, to to map mm-hmm. out what their projection would be. But then there's also mm-hmm. a part where you can just unfold and see what vision wants to come naturally so i find that a very interesting part of the unconscious and i'm just wondering Mm -hmm. as we begin to to uh, slowly wrap up um if you could touch on symbolism as well like is is that something you found helpful to explore um for yourself or read about yeah that's a great question actually to to Mm. close with um When it comes to dreams, for example, I think the risk is that we look into the symbolism of um, an element of our dream and believe that our dream means what that symbol means. Um, But there is a combination. There is the archetype, which might be something very uh, old that exists in the, the energy of a culture or a population. Um, But then there are the personal um, uh, interpretations as well. So, for example, if you dream of a house and I dream of a house, or maybe we dream about the same house, we dream about the Eiffel Tower, we both dream about the Eiffel Tower, but the tower won't have the same meaning for both of us. So it's important to bring our own associations and our own uh, feelings and our own experience of the Eiffel Tower and as it shows in your dream to be able to, um, to start to make an accurate interpretation because otherwise it just becomes this, um, you know, like you go to a dream dictionary and look for the term and this is what it means. Um, that's a very reductive way of uh, interpreting things. Um, so I think when it comes to symbolism, it's very important to sit with it and see what emerges as you're reflecting on those symbols and not be very tempted to start you know, Googling um, what the symbol means. Uh, but of course, understanding, also understanding that um, the meaning from a dictionary can be helpful um, to see if there are archetypal energies at play in some way and how you might be able to leverage that to to use that in a positive way in your life. Yeah, I think that's so interesting because the 
sort of subtle level or the intuitive level that you mentioned of the highly sensitive people and that does acronym speaks to that. Like we're not trying to be a reductionist or mechanically reduce, but feel into archetypical energies at play, which then, you know, kind of goes down the Jung hole and then leads into mythology and 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 all of that. So back, yeah. I guess that's another conversation. For sure. Um, so I thought to, to close on quite a fun question, which was, uh, I think we both played World of Warcraft and <laughs> <laughs> being in that whole world of mythology or fantasy that mm. draws on so many different cultures, mythos, um, religions, even, um, you know, old traditions. What, what do you feel like drew you into that world? Uh, I know we both play, played night elves, but do you see any parallels between that? fantasy world of you know world of warcraft and kind of that work in the unconscious or subconscious Mm. um it's really interesting to read about the hero's journey Mm. um joseph campbell did a lot of uh, work around that using jungian psychology um and once you learn about the hero's journey, you do start to see the symbols. This is why films like Harry Potter and, you know, they become very famous because they use a lot of archetypal um, symbolism. Um, oh, I forget what the question was. <laughs> <laughs> do you see any parallels between that world? Like why, oh. why you were drawn to that world, maybe? And, yeah. and maybe and I think, coaching, yeah. Yeah, I think um films and games that use archetypal symbolism can become very engaging because they appeal to parts of us that represent those archetypes you know the ugly ogre or the um you know fairy like elf or the um all these things might represent parts of us um and parts of society as well um and they tend to be very inclusive in terms of a very wide variety of uh, personalities so i think that's what makes them very attractive i'm not sure i i'm not sure what the applications to coaching are there probably are some but uh, more remote yeah i thought it was just an interesting question since we both (laughs) kind of were immersed in that world and it does seem like a highly archetypical world yeah for sure um super interesting stuff um yeah thank you for sitting down and sharing all of your wisdom and insight today i'm sure everyone will appreciate it um in my coaching i often say to people go slow to go far so is there anything any advice that you'd like to impart on and how people could indeed go slow to go far oh um I don't know, the answer to that question isn't coming up for me, but I was, um, as you were speaking, I just noticed how how connected uh, I felt that you were to me throughout this whole um, conversation. And um, I'm really grateful that you ask such insightful questions because that um, brings out the best in your the people you interview and certainly brought out the best in me. So hopefully that's to the benefit of your viewers and hope they will enjoy this. (laughs) Oh, thank you so much. And the feelings uh, mutual is such a pleasure. Um, Just as we um, leave today, is there people, um, is there any way people can get in contact with you if they're interested in your work and the, um, you know, support that you give people? Yeah, sure. Um, Through my website, um, www.beatricezornek.com um, and I also offer a free resource which is a, it's an ebook um, it's quite comprehensive and it's called uh, seven tools to coach your inner critic so if that's something that resonates with you um, I've written it from the perspective of a highly sensitive person and from my work with highly sensitive people so um, that could be a you know a useful resource that people can download for free. Awesome. And I'll get the links uh, for that and put them in the description below so oh, people perfect. can thank you. access that. Cool. Thank you so much again, uh, Beatrice. Um, thank you, everybody, uh, for watching, taking the time. And um, yeah, if you're interested in Beatrice's work, go ahead and check that out. Thanks again, Beatrice. Thank you.
Thank you as well.